Thanks for having us. We're super excited to be here. Um, we have a talk, a talk lined up with uh, the title called Beyond the Interface, but I'll immediately say this is not what we're going to talk about. <laughs> yep. Um, I mean, put those two guys together in a room for two hours to rehearse something, and we end up two weeks later with something else, which is great. Um, so what are we going to say? We're going to talk not about ourselves, that's first, but we're going to talk about branding overall, more specifically about the limits of branding. We're going to talk about the end of storytelling, we're going to cover many things. It's basically, this presentation is basically an outline of all the conversation we had over the last days, I guess. Um, so if you feel it gets messy in the middle, don't be scared, don't run away, it's perfectly normal. Uh, we'll try to make it clear at the end. At some point, we will have a conclusion. So. <laughs> Hopefully. So, we're probably being rude. We didn't introduce ourselves. So, my name is Thomas. I am a digital director at BASE. And my name is Thomas, and I'm creative director at BASE. And we both work at BASE. <laughs> so, BASE. Um, just, uh, you know, mandatory introduction. We have... Um, we exist for, I think, about 25 years, and we have been, I mean, we're showing some, some jobs on the screen as I do this quick introduction. We've been working uh, for a lot of brands, and we have studios in Brussels, in New York. We also have a studio in Geneva, and we have uh, recently opened a studio in Melbourne. So we're very excited about that, because we hope we can fly to Melbourne one day. It hasn't happened yet. Um, we're active in a lot of sectors. We started in the cultural and fashion sectors mostly, but we tend to say that we don't specialize um, in anything. However, as you can see, I think we do can say that we specialize in branding. We're a branding studio, of course. So, branding is basically what we want to discuss with you today. Um, and again, as I said before, more specifically, the limits of branding. This whole conversation started from a pretty simple phenomenon that we have observed uh, within the last years, maybe. Every brand starts looking the same. So, last week, again, we were in New York for some meetings, and we saw that. Okay, <laughs> so if you start paying attention uh, in the street, in the airport, in the mall, wherever you want, it's pretty clear that all brands today start looking the same. If you dig deeper in some specific sector and you look at the different trends and the recurring patterns, it's pretty clear that design tends to be homogenized. Um, all startups start looking like startups or tech companies. Fashion brands play the codes of fashion, banks pay, play the code of banks, and so on, and so on, and so on. We call that phenomenon blending, which means basically uh, a deviation of branding that is not about standing out anymore, but that is about blending in a specific sector. It's basically the teenage syndrome of brands today. Meaning, I want to be part of the group, therefore I will dress like them, so I can be part of the group. Um, there is probably a second reason for that. It's that every one of us in this room, I guess, uh, all designers, we all look at the same references. We all have access to the same visual culture. And because of that, sameness is a logical consequence of that, because we're all fed with the same visual background. In digital, <clears throat> it looks like it's even worse, right? These are some of the most used apps of today's. 
And if you look at them, they all, it looks as if they're all apps under the same brand. They all use those circular avatars. They all use line icons positioned neatly at the bottom to form the navigation. It's really, it's really striking. However, I think it's, it's probably a natural phenomenon that's going on. Uh, every industry, and especially if a new medium comes up, goes through some kind of standardization process. If you think about it, uh, television went through the same 50 years ago. Radio probably went through the same 100 years ago. We need some kind of, we probably need a decade or so to really uh, find the extremes of the medium, in this case digital, and through figuring out all the extremes, we tend to come to some kind of standard that, everyone's agree that everyone agrees on. And um, if you read this quote by usability expert Donald Norman, um, you can say that maybe that's not even a bad thing, that standardization in, uh, in design and digital in this case. <coughs> We at Base Design, we fell into this trap or this phenomenon. Uh, we, know, we witnessed this firsthand. This was our website, <clears throat> I think about seven years ago. And it's kind of quirky and it's kind of fun and a lot of stuff is going on. There is this uh, crazy navigation on top. But we realized, um, and although this website kind of um, represents the spirit of Base at that point in time, and maybe still today, um, we figured that clients, potential clients, had a lot of trouble to uh, even f do some basic uh, tasks on that website. For instance, when a, when a potential client wanted to contact us, some of them couldn't even figure it out. So that's a huge problem, right? So a couple years later, we said, OK, we're going to redesign the website. And if you now go to basedesign.com, you will see uh, this version. So it's pretty standardized, I think. There's the logo on the top left. There's the navigation on the top right. There's like some sentence kind of introducing who we are, what we do, and the latest jobs are, are positioned right below. By doing that, we realized after some time that basically we started to look like our competitors a lot. <laughs> so again, even though the website was performing better, we also realized it's just more of the same and it's a bit boring, right? So we trapped ourselves in blending. Um, and this led to a question, a very simple question in the end, like, is blending the end of branding? Because this sounds like a big thing. Uh, so we wanted to push it further and explore and try to answer this question. From there, we have two possible answers, right? It's yes or no. So I'll tend to say yes. I think if we go back to the very essence of what branding is, um, branding lies back to a very human and fundamental human need, the one to be identified. So branding is all about identification. I want to be noticed among the crowd. If Charlie didn't have the hats or the glasses or the sweatshirt, I wouldn't be able to recognize him and I wouldn't be able to identify him. By the way, he's just there. Here? Um, so, to put it simple, branding is about identification, and identification re requires differentiation. In that sense, blending, as a deviation of branding, is a nonsense. It's like, it means that we live in a world like that, which we probably don't want to. At the same time, you can say, no, that's not an issue that everything starts to look the same, or at least that things start to get standardized. Because when I arrived in Beijing airport a couple years ago, I was happy that there was some standardization going on on a global scale in uh, signage, for instance. Thanks to this sign, I could figure out where to catch my train. And if I go to any of the major cities uh, today in the world, I'm happy to see uh, um, subway maps that look like these subway maps. You can say, oh, they all look the same and it's boring. Yes, but at the same time, it's super, it's super good because in a couple of seconds, I can figure out how to go to another part of, of the city. Same thing is happening in other sectors. These are coffee shops all over the planet and basically they all look the same, right? At the same time, I have to admit, when I'm in Mexico, and I want to have a good cup of coffee, I'll probably go to a bar like this because for some reason I tend to connect this style, this type of interior design 
um, with good coffee, with the codes of good coffee. So I, I think I would go there. And the same thing you can say about apps, of course, the apps I already showed. I mean, okay, standardized design, but at the same time it means that when I download an app today from the App Store, and that app uses some kind of standardized design, it's actually great because in a matter of seconds, I'll be able to figure out how the app works and I'll be able to do what I want to do through the app. There's another point that is probably interesting to note and it's the fact that these are some of the strongest brands of today, even though their interface all looks exactly the same. So I think the interface and the graphical visual layer on top of those brands is maybe just uh, a superficial layer that doesn't really represent the brand. In the end, we recognize these apps and we, we feel strongly related to them because they allow us to do something. And that thing that they allow us to do is really differentiating. Uh, we know what Instagram can do for us. We know what Airbnb can do for us. And that's really the differentiating point of all those brands. So to summarize, I think we can say from one point of view that standardization is definitely convenient and that a brand is much more than its visual UI. Okay, fair enough. But it means then that we are reaching a paradox, right? Um, branding seems to be stretched between two dynamics. One is the, again, fundamental need for differentiation. The other one is, and it goes with the world we are living in, the need for standardization. So what we are saying is that after 10 minutes, we couldn't reach an answer, right? True. Okay, so maybe then the question is not right. Yes, maybe we need to reframe the question. Um, because I remember a story you once told me, Thomas. Uh, it's about uh, branding reaching, at some point in time, branding always reaches the end of a cycle. Branding kind of, uh, reaches a limit in what it is doing at that certain point in time. Yep. So maybe to go deeper in that, um, we need to get back to the very beginning of what branding is. Brand is a word that comes from the old English brand, which means fire and flame, or the old Germanic brandas, I don't know who said it. Brandas. Brandas. Uh, flame, flaming, and sword. It basically meant at first marked with an hot iron. So to keep it short, yep. To keep it short, as soon as mankind starting owning, trading, exchanging, producing things, they needed a very simple system to identify those things as their own. So from men in the cave, they started putting a sign or a little mark on their coats, for instance with painting or with blood, uh, to just say, this is my coat, don't touch it. Um, and over time it scaled, and Egypt, in antique Egypt, men started doing exactly the same, but in a more permanent way, with an art Byron uh, marking. And over time it scaled, and it went within different cultures and through different countries, so uh, in antiquities, we had a lot of potters marking their potteries to sign them, or even uh, up until the Middle Age, uh, we had, like, for instance, stone cutters uh, marking every single stone they cut in order to get paid, uh, as simple as that. So, we, uh, back in those days, branding was about just putting a mark of property and of provenance, and we ended up there. As the world scaled up, again, we had too many of those marks, and it was not enough anymore to convey it and to, for brands to be identified. So for the first time in branding history, we reached a limit. We just too, had too much of them. So we had to figure out something new. As the world got industrialized and we went into mass production, the um, objects weren't crafted by and by individuals anymore. So we had to deal with way more abstract entities such as corporation or factories. Um, this implied that corporation had to process the act of branding way more mechanically than before. So they started putting their name and a little sign next to it on every single product that went out of the factory and every tra transportation mean that went out of the factory. So doing that, corporations starting owning brands. They starting registering it. Um, they starting investing a pretty big amount of money in it. 
Um, and over time, what they did is that they enriched that, meaning it was not just anymore about just putting a name on things, they added the color, they bring in some different typefaces, they started using different graphics, and so on and so on, up until consolidating that in a brand book, we call that, um, and up until it becomes what we call today visual identities. But, you see it coming, right? Yes, <clears throat> when I see the slide, I think I, I see where you're going. At some point, there were just too many identities, and it wasn't enough for a brand to stand out, to differentiate itself from the, from the rest of the pack. So we're reaching a limit again. And so we had to come up with something new again. Also because, again, the world scaled up. Uh, we went into the consumerism era. Um, the challenge for brands at this time was not anymore only to be identified. It was to be picked because there was too many products up there and then we, brands needed to guide people in picking XYZ product rather than another one. So why is that beer better than any, one, any other beer? Because, it's, because of its nourishing properties, it's written. Guinness is one of the most nourishing beverage, richer in carbohydrates than a glass of milk. Therefore, you have to go for a glass of Guinness. That's logical. <laughs> this was basically advertising. Uh, this is where we came up with advertising. Uh, could brand started launching messages and connecting directly with people in order to convince them of something. They were not only about being identified anymore. They were about launching some messages out there in order to connect directly with people. What's interesting is that by doing that, they had to enrich their vocabulary. It was not anymore about just putting a sign or mark on things. It was about building up an entire expression for brands to be able to connect with people again. So as we see here, brands starting to be identified to a certain art direction, to a certain way of speaking, to a, maybe a little touch of humor, a certain attitude. Back in those days, branding was about launching messages with a certain style. But, see it coming? Yes, then you go to Times Square in New York and you see this and then you realize at some point, oh, too many messages, too many codes, too many advertisements. So I think again, we're reaching a limit. And what's next, Thomas? <laughs> wait, wait, it's coming. <laughs> well, it's probably the last step we are currently in. <clears throat> there was again way too many products up there. So what we did is that instead of marketing products, we started marketing brands. Um, this is the Simon Sinek theory, right? It's the golden circle. People don't buy what you are doing, they buy it because of why you are doing it. So brands started building up huge narrative, huge storytelling. They started investing a lot of money in identifying the values, uh, putting words on the business culture, uh, trying to build up some narratives that people could relate to and launch emotional stories up there uh, that anyone could grasp. And we ended up with, how can I say that, way less mechanical uh, selling pitch. And we went into a much more viral and intangible way for brands to communicate and to own stories. Um, <coughs> So, we believe that we are currently in the era of storytelling for branding. But, we also believe that this is reaching a limit today. Yes, and we see, or we notice three reasons why storytelling is probably ending today. I mean, if you see this, I think all of us in this room, uh, I mean, our gut starts to react to this, right? This is bullshit. This is storytelling bullshit. At some point, there were brands like Apple, like Nike, who were doing amazing things and telling this story, and it felt very genuine and very true. And that's probably the reason why I think most of us in this room really like those brands, and we, we even at some point love those brands. But if a, a brand like Total is doing this, then you just know this doesn't fly, this, this is not real. Some brands are even fully trapped in their own storytelling bullshit. I don't know if you recognize this mission statement, this story of, a, of one of the biggest brands of today. It's the story of Facebook. Of course, if you see what's happening and you 
put this picture next to their mission statement, to the story they, they tell every day. And if, if you see this image and Mark Zuckerberg being uh, questioned in, in US Congress, then you just know, okay, this something is not right. This story does not work. And then, Maybe. oh, sorry. No, go for it. Maybe another, another reason, a second reason is again the amount. Each time, as we have seen in the history, each time the world scales um, and we have too much of something, we have to come up with something else because it doesn't work anymore. <coughs> this simple, and, and over the last 10 years, I think with the race with social networks and uh, digital overall, the content production has extended so much that it becomes completely crazy. Everything is a story today. I'm a story, you are a story, yes. this event is a story, my breakfast this morning was a story, and so on and so on and so on. <laughs> and this very simple example shows that. Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, uh, estimated that five exabytes was the digital storage required to store all the content ever produced by mankind from the birth of the world up until 2003. Today, it represents the content produced on Earth between two and three hours, which means basically that every of those stories are just nothing because it's completely drawn within, this, within the noise. And then this is probably the last reason why we think storytelling is, is dying. Uh, if Barack Obama was probably the personification of storytelling, then Trump basically killed it, right? Um, also, if you see the bus, the, that became a symbol of the trap, um, I mean, the, the fake news people started to believe. It's been, been the symbol of, of Brexit. Um, then we realize that today there's two nations and, and, and definitely the UK um, going through shit, a political shit, because of uh, something they thought, a story they thought was true, but only hours after the referendum, um, after the result of the referendum, there was this politician saying that, okay, the message, the story that we have there on the bus, well, actually we're not gonna do that, right? But everyone voted, I mean, a lot of people voted to leave the European Union because they believe the story that was on that bus. So what we believe in is that storytelling doesn't fly anymore. And we have to come up with something else. And our intuition is that this something else is about experiences. We believe that branding comes to the experience driven era. It's not anymore about telling something. It's about making pe people feel something. Because at the end of the day, people no longer what trust whatever you say, unless they can experience that by themselves as being true, and they can make their own judgment out of it. So basically, if Simon Sinek said, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, then we are saying, that's true, Simon, <laughs> but only if people really feel that it's genuine, that what that what you say, why you do it, is true. Then the big question becomes, okay, but how can we make people feel that a brand story is true? And it's not an easy one. Well, the first um, very obvious thing is that actions always speak louder than words. If you do something, it's stronger than if you say something. For instance, if we take Patagonia as an example, it's probably the most obvious, exam obvious example of a strong brand nowadays because it, they act on things more than they say things. When they do a protest in the street, they are way stronger than if they do any statements like we care for the planet on their about page on their website because every other brand does that. Any brand today say that they care for the planet, but Patagonia, what they do is that they go in the street, they do act concretely on things. Whatever people might think of it, they do it. What's interesting is that in that example, branding is almost a threat for them because their acts are so strong that if they go into marketing or to classic branding, branding then that might endanger 
uh, the, let's say, the spontaneity of what they are doing. So it's the debranding effect. It's, it's, they don't need much branding for them to be strong brands. Hey, come on. The Rijks Museum is another uh, brand a museum from the Netherlands that uh, puts their money where their mouth is. They show what they believe in through action. At some point, I think about 10 years ago, they released their full collection in a digital format uh, and made it publicly available to all, through all developers uh, by releasing an open API. If you think about it, that's crazy. But it's like Coca-Cola saying, hey, everyone, here is our secret recipe. You can use it. Brew digital Coca-Cola as much as you want. Because in the end, the collection of the Rex Museum is the only thing that is really true to them and that really differentiates them from any other museum. Okay, there's the physical location and so on, but the real uh, value of the Rijksmuseum is in its collection. Um, and then we couldn't leave this one out. Twitter yesterday, I mean, in, in all the shit that social media is going through, and um, I mean, a lot of people are blaming social media for the fake news and so on and so on. Twitter uh, yesterday night, late night, decided to stop or to ban any kind of political advertising on the social network. So in a time where Facebook is under extreme fire, I mean, I think this is a very bold and a very powerful statement. It's a good one. But all those three are very strong acts. The thing is that, as we said before, it's probably not branding, right? It's all clients act. It's whatever they decide to do. And I, we as branding experts have probably no control on that. Uh, we can probably influence them, we can track the bullshit, we can confront them with acts, but we can never change who they are and what they do. Our role is to perfectly understand that, what they are and why they do things, and find the best way to translate that to people, basically. And this is probably where we can make a difference. In the way we're going to bring up those stories up to people, if we manage somehow to switch from telling stories and, and, and being into passive narratives, and instead of that going for active experiences and providing people with active experiences in brand touch points, then maybe we have a chance to solve the trustability question. This is also in some way what the Rex Museum was doing when they released the Rex Studio. So they released the Open API, which I talked about just before. And almost immediately after that, they built their own brand experience on top of that. It's what they call the Rex Studio. It's a part of their website, and anyone can go there and discover all the artworks in, in extreme detail. It's super beautiful. But at the same time, anyone can also register for an account, sign up, and you can make your own collection of artworks that you love and basically you can play your own, you can be your own curator and make your own exhibition digitally and then share your exhibition with, uh, with your friends. So it's, a, it's again a, a very nice, it's, it's the Rex Museum basically saying we believe that just like any museum, art um, should be accessible to all and we want uh, to have more people to have access to art because through that we believe we everyone will become a better human and by being better human the planet becomes a better place to live in and so on and so on but you can tell this story on your website or you can just uh, create experience that basically are a translation of that story into an experience this extra layer of bringing a story alive instead of telling it is for us the next step in branding. We want to call that experiential branding. It's basically branding, but driven by the experience. It's about elaborating new kinds of behavior for brands, not new kinds of stories, but new kinds of behaviors for them to connect in a new way with people. Um, to illustrate that, because then the, big, then the question is, OK, how can we provide people with memorable experiences, right? So to try to answer that question, we just wanted to share with you three little attempts that we did uh, over the last months, um, just to try to find some clues. The first one is a pitch proposition that we did for radio. Uh, it was a pitch for radio in Belgium. 
their motto was uh, life is music. And I remember when we went out of the briefing room and we felt, oh man, life is music. Do we really want to say that? Um, <laughs> We didn't feel is like building up an entire narrative on that. We didn't feel is even to use that as a tagline. It felt way too cheesy. So nevertheless, it was very true to them. It was very accurate because they were very into the, let's say the generosity of a public radio um, and they have a huge impact uh, socially. So we couldn't put that aside. We decided to look for ways for the brand to express that without saying it. And after a few explorations, we ended up in something surprising. <laughs> yep, I'm not loud anymore. What we started working on is basically an identity that would come to life through music. So we didn't want to say life is music, but we did want to build an identity that comes to life through music. Then it would be something that people could experience by themselves instead of being told that life is music. So we used uh, new web technologies and <clears throat> that react on the mic of, of any ah. type of device. Ah. And so as people would make noise, the type would start to dance. And that became a cornerstone of uh, what we envisioned would be their new identity. Yeah, we started building up like an entire vocabulary on that. Uh, so we designed a typeface, we started um, yeah, playing around with that. And what was funny is that even for ourselves as designer, when we were working on that, it was pretty fun actually. Like we were in the studio, clapping our hand in front of our screen, yelling at our screen. We, people thought that we turned crazy. Um, and it was pretty fun because even for ourselves, it was a nice little thing to own and to experiment with, which is basically what we wanted to create. So, yeah, we started pushing that a bit further and we started working on a brand that we wanted to be a brand to be experienced first. a version of their website where if people uh, were listening to the radio, they could just go to the website of this specific radio station and immediately have some kind of visual layer that represented what was going on uh, at that point in time uh, live on the radio. So if the host was talking about being sick, she could share a story on Instagram and we could show that story live uh, on the website while she was, she was discussing this. If she had a question for the audience, we could bring us some interactive module with the question. If she was talking about some kind of event, you probably know it, then um, um, we could show that, that piece of content. And especially when a song started playing, we used open APIs to um, put the lyrics on the screen and of course the lyrics danced uh, to the sound that was currently currently playing live on the radio. It was like a starting point for exploring the universe of the artists of the radio station and the host of the radio station. We also pulled in YouTube videos, so it was really, uh, you heard a song you liked, you went to the website and you could start discovering the full world of that artist. So, building that radio brand as, in the first place, a brand to be experienced was pretty fun and it opened many doors. Like, we started unfolding this entire idea and entire vocabulary upon many different touch points. And of course, for radio, what's nice is that they have many, many, many places to express themselves. It would have made much sense in live events, for instance. It would have been an identity, again, that interacts directly with the environment instead of having, again, someone telling, oh, guys, life is music. Um, and even though they went into marketing campaign or whatever, uh, they could have done things maybe differently. So, I mean, working on that was pretty interesting. We were pretty up to it. Uh, we Very won the pitch, exciting. but this direction didn't fly. And so we had to start over and to do something else. And maybe you know it, it has been released um, 
few Almost months ago. A year ago. And it's the Studio Brussels radio in Belgium. So it's different, but very cool. Still. <laughs> <laughs> we still like it. No, we, we really love it. Huh? Don't get me wrong. Okay. Um, maybe a second uh, different, though. Uh, maybe a second example is uh, a little thing that we did for the Art and History Museum. I don't know if anyone has been there already. Uh, it's Musée du Cinquantenaire in Brussels. Uh, they changed the name for Art and History Museum. Um, we've been asked basically to work on the new brands a um, few years ago, I think. And first thing we did is to go there and to experience by yourself the place and the museum. And it's a pretty weird experience, actually. So you arrive there in this Parc du Cinquantenaire, which is not the most welcoming place on earth. Uh, you arrive in front of the great building, super huge, uh, not that welcoming either. Uh, you enter the door, uh, they don't have a lot of money, so let's say that the state of the building is not so uh, up to date. You go down some, uh, on the stairs and finally you enter the exhibition space. And when you enter an exhibition space, suddenly you feel you are not in Belgium anymore and you feel you are not in 2019 anymore. It's like as if you are just projected in another time, in another place. Um, which was, as an experience, of course, pretty in line of any kind of experience that the museum could bring, right? But we wanted to take that as a starting point. So, during working on the branding, we started uh, thinking of the different touch points, and one thing we discussed with them is that we didn't, we didn't want them to say, oh, we have the greatest and biggest collection of art on Earth, I mean, you can say it, but no one will notice that. Let's try instead to again build a touch point where people could experience those artworks the same way we did coming to your museum. So we said we won't build a website where we have all the art pieces in it. We don't want to do that. What you're going to do is that you're going to pick 10 artworks, the most important for you, you're going to select them, you're going to work on content, you're going to explain them as if you were guiding people within the museum, and we're going to build an immersive experience around that. So people landing on your website would have kind of the same, or at least a similar experience than the one they would have coming to the museum. So we did that. They picked uh, 10 art pieces. Uh, we <laughs> built a little website around it. And it's basically, again, based on that idea of being projected. So each time you enter an art piece, you arrive in a very simple immersive interface, and you have this little story that gets rolled on. It's very simple. It's not rocket science, but it's just a little bit different shading as an experience for a museum website. One last example, because the time is up, um, is one of our, I mean, a great client of ours. It's called, the company is called Axel Vervoort. And um, I mean, the, the, the guy himself, Axel, is pretty famous. Lately, he's been doing the interior design of the apartment of Kanye West and Kim Kardashian, just to put a few names on the table. Um, <laughs> but he's, um, I mean, in terms of communication, they didn't want to communicate so much anymore on, on the terms of interior design. They wanted to uh, talk about two of their main activities, being the gallery. They have a uh, contemporary art gallery, some contemporary art galleries. And they also deal in antique objects. Some of those objects, it's amazing, are over 2,000 two years old. Um, the main idea of Axel Vervoort is that they are looking for timeless beauty into everything they do. Um, of course, we could tell this story 
uh, like we would probably have done a couple of years ago and just say on the website, Axel Vervoort is doing two things and looking for timeless beauty and everything they do. But we said, how can we turn this into an active experience for people uh, to experience so they would uh, remember it? And basically what we did is we have this homepage. So at the, at the very first touch point with the website, you have to choose a site and you have to uh, pick either the gallery or the anti-care section of the website. And once you are in uh, one of those sites, so the white part being the gallery, the contemporary art gallery, and the black part being the anti-care part, there's always the other side just at the, at the, at the very end of your uh, browser window because it's still Axel, Axel Vervoort and there's still the combination of those two worlds always together. Okay, we could discuss that for hours, uh, but I think as you said, the time is up. Maybe it's time to reach a conclusion because we promised that we will make things clear at the end. Um, so, many brands look the same nowadays, but maybe it's not such an issue. Um, the means of expression for brands today are so wide that they become much more than just a type, a color, a logo, or a composition system that might look the same than the others, given the amount of brands we have today. Blending, nevertheless, as a phenomenon, as something interesting, is that it's, it's probably a sign that we have reached the end of a life cycle in the branding industry. So what is clear is that brands have to stop just telling stories. Um, they need people to feel that those stories are true. Um, okay, can you, so long list story feeling. One way of doing that is by creating active brand experience, much more than just brand, passive brand narratives, which are things we used to do in the past. Last thing, last thing that we noticed is that the, this idea of branding going into life cycles get faster and faster. If it probably took millennia to go from marks to identities, it took only centuries to go from identities to advertising and probably decades for storytelling to jump in. And as we saw, storytelling after maybe 20 years is no longer on the table. So two questions. We believe that we are in the experiential branding today. One is, of course, what is coming next? What is clear is it's going super fast. So basically, I, it, maybe we can come back next year and tell you that story <laughs> of what's next after that. So see you. Thank you very much. Thank you.